everyone in today's video i'm going to be showing you how i created the scene so this is a breakdown video not a step-by-step -step tutorial instead i'll be giving you insight into how this entire scene was actually constructed so i'll be talking about how the landscape was created how the human was created but most importantly how that giant wall of fire and smoke was created in this animation it's something a lot of you guys have been asking me about so i thought i you know, I really need to put this video together just to show you how it's done. We'll be exporting our VDBs from Embergen, bringing them into Cinema 4D, applying some shading and lighting and rendering it with Octane Render. So if you're interested in this workflow, then without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so before we even talk about the fire and smoke simulation, I want to talk about the scene. And it's actually very simple. So you'll see if I snap out of this camera, you'll see that we've got all of these rocks in my scene and I've strategically placed them so that wherever this camera is looking from, it creates this illusion of depth. Now, it's actually not really an illusion. You can see I've purposely placed some rocks in the foreground and some further in the back just to create that depth. Uh, but this is one asset. It's a single 3D scanned asset. And this asset was obtained from Quixel Mega Scans. So if you guys are not familiar with Quixel Mega Scans, then I'm introducing you to probably the best resource ever for 3D scanned assets. So I'm using the Limestone Quarry uh, Asset Pack. You can see over here I've, um, I've logged in and I've just typed in Limestone Quarry. And then I just used this single asset. Where is it? It's over here, which is called Quarry Cliff. So I've downloaded this at 8K resolution. And I also downloaded the LOD 0. You can see you can go all the way to LOD 8. So this is level of detail. Level of detail 0 is going to give you the highest level of detail. The polygon count is still going to be quite low and optimized. But I always try and download the LOD 0 because it just gives me a better accurate, a better representation that's a lot more accurate with the 3D scanned asset. So that's all it is. It's just the exact same asset and I've duplicated it multiple times, as you can see over here, and just positioned it strategically to create this environment. So that's all it is. So I just want to mention something with the material that's applied onto these rocks from the mega scan asset. If I open up the diffuse, you can see over here, this is at 8K resolution. And let me just bring up the Octane Live Viewer. All right, and just send the scene over. And I want to make sure I'm also snapping to my camera. All right, so there we go. So here's our rocks in the scene. But the color of these rocks is actually not the original color. So I've imported the original diffuse map, but I increased the gamma a little bit just to uh, intentionally make these rocks a lot darker. And this was... Uh, for the sake of composition because I didn't want too much attention to be on the rocks in the foreground if they were very light my attention would be drawn more towards these rocks instead of our main character over here that's basically burning up with all of these flames and smoke so I just increased the gamma a bit and then the normal map was really important because it adds this additional detail on top of the rock the surface detail and that's the original uh, normal map from uh, Quixel Mega Scans, but I just increased the power on that map just to make it a little bit more intense. And that was the basic setup for the material for these rocks. It's just a glossy material type, and I'm just using a diffuse. I'm using the normal, and then on the roughness, I just bumped up the float value so that it's, you know, it, it applies a lot of roughness onto these rocks and it doesn't look extremely shiny. And I think with the specular as well, yeah, and with the specular value, I put my V over here on a little bit of a darker gray so that it doesn't have extremely strong uh, specular highlights. So we also have a human being in our scene. And this dude over here is actually a 3D scanned asset as well. So I obtained this 3D scanned asset from a website called 3dscanstore.com. And I purchased this pack called Male Visualization Characters. And it's basically this guy over here. And yeah, that's it. I just imported the OBJ, applied my material onto the character, and it was good to go. And this is what frames my entire shot and creates the meaning behind self-reflection with this guy looking at himself. Okay, so if you're wondering how this version of this dude was actually textured, because he looks more like a statue. If I open up that material, the diffuse, I just downloaded a concrete material uh, with some discoloration on it and applied it onto the diffuse. And then the most important part of this material is actually the bump. So if I go into the bump, I'm using one of my own tileable uh, materials over here. So this is from one of my packs, uh, which is my tileable displacement patterns. So you can use this as displacement, but I decided to use this as bump. 
and it's from one of the categories called organic so it's this organic rocky mater uh, material 4k resolution 100 percent tileable and i just imported that tiff and when i applied that onto my material i increased the power uh, a little bit and it creates like all of these you know like this damage and indentation on the statue that makes it look a lot more believable so that plays a very important role uh, with this material okay so let's talk about how this entire scene is actually lit and it's very simple it's us just using a regular octane sky so you create these octane skies by going to object and hdri environment so it's an hdri that i've obtained so originally i was actually using an octane daylight but you'll see i didn't really like the lighting i felt like it was a bit too flat and the reason why I opted for an HDRI, number one, is that it really helps with realism. And uh, this HDRI also included these clouds. So I thought that looked really cool in the distance. You've got these awesome purple clouds with this blue sky. And on the HDRI, I just played around with a bit of the power. I reduced it to make, make the scene look a little, bit, a little bit more moody. And obviously, you can play around with the ro rotation until you find, you know, a certain part of your HDRI that you think looks really cool within your scene. But I highly, highly recommend using HDRIs, especially for outdoor scenes. So if you want to find some HDRIs, this one is actually from a an asset pack. It's from HDRI Skies Pack 20, right, which is this. But you can find free HDRIs on HDRI Haven. If you head over to this website, you just go to Browse 200 Plus HDRIs. And there we go, they, they have a skies category. So you can find whatever you find appealing over here. Click on that. You don't even need to create an account or sign in or anything. You click on the HDRI, find your resolution, download that. And then in Cinema 4D, like I said, you go to objects, create an HDRI environment. And then you simply would go into the texture, click on these three dots and load in your HDRI. And that's going to light your entire scene. And it's going to make your outdoor scenes look way more believable. And I just highly recommend that you use HDRIs, especially with outdoor scenes. Okay, so the scene is pretty simple, right? Rocks, human, sky. But probably the most important aspect of this entire animation and the reason why you're probably watching this video is you want to figure out how to create this fire and smoke. Right, so this is a VDB that's been imported into Cinema 4D. Uh, but before we head over to Embergen, and that's the program that I'm using, by the way, to create this fire and smoke, it's called Embergen. And if you've got Octane Render 2020, you'll actually get it for free with your subscription. Uh, but before I open up Embergen, I want to give this guy all of the credit on YouTube. His name is Solid Motion VFX. He actually showed the community how to apply the shading and materials onto a VDB in Octane Render. So without this tutorial, I wouldn't know how to do this. So I do want to give him some credit. Anyway, let's head over to Embergen and I want to show you how to export out these VDBs. So the first time you open up Embergen FX, you're going to be greeted by this real-time fire simulation. And this is what makes this program revolutionary. There's no caching time. You see your results immediately. Everything is node-based. You can see if I select one of these nodes and adjust some of these settings, it updates in real time. So absolutely incredible piece of software. So all I did was I opened up Embergen. I went to File, Open Project. I'll click on no over here. And this takes me to my install directory for Embergen. And I went to the presets folder and I selected this preset created by one of the, uh, one of the developers called Fire Tornado. And I just went to open. So this is the, uh, the VDB or the simulation that's playing in my animation. So I didn't change any settings. I just exported this out of the program. So here by simulation, if I just click and drag on simulation over here and I let go, it's gonna give me the option to create export VDB. So I select that and now here by file name, I just want to click on this folder icon and on your desktop, just create a folder for these VDBs. So I'll call this VDB tutorial, go into the folder and I'm going to make sure I'm not including any numbers. So I'll just say VDB tutorial and click on save. Now over here by the timing control, I want to choose the number of frames for my sequence. But now what's really important is I want to choose you know, a frame where the sequence looks really interesting. So you can see this just continues for infinity. I'm on 2000 something frames, but if I press spacebar, I can pause my simulation. But more, most importantly, if I press R, it takes it back to zero. So now if I press spacebar and play the simulation and maybe pause it, I can see still on frame 67, the simulation doesn't look that interesting. So I'm gonna continue playing. So on frame 160, 
I like how the simulation starts looking. So I'm going to take note of that number. Sorry, that's 170. So I want my first frame to be on 170. All right, and then the number of frames. So I want I wanted to start on 170 and I want the animation to play for 300 frames. All right, so from 170, it's going to play for 300 frames. And there we go. Now, very important on the export types, I want to export density, flames, and I want to export temperature. Now, in the Octane documentation, you can also apply motion blur to your VDBs using velocity. I'm not 100% sure how to set it up. But if you want to do, find a way to export velocity, there we go. You can actually select that and export out velocity as well. But the most important is density, temperature, and flames. But I'll just select this for the sake of the tutorial. Now, under the coordinate system, for some reason in Octane Render, if I export this out as Z up right-handed, even though it looks like it's in the correct orientation, it's going to export it on its side. So I want to make sure I change this to Y up right-handed. And that should be in the correct orientation. But I'll show you how to rotate the VDBs in Cinema 4D as well. So that won't be an issue. So right now, I'm good to go. I just click on Export Now. We get this yellow progress bar over here. And as soon as it reaches frame 170, it's going to be exporting out frames. It's going to be exporting out 300 frames from frame 170. And it's exporting out all those VDBs to this folder. Okay, so I've exported out my VDBs. I didn't choose to export out 300 frames. I just did it up until 145. So when I open up my folder, you can see it says VDB tutorial, and then there's four digits. This is really important. I'll show you why that's so important. You can see it goes from frame zero all the way to frame 144. So let's open up Cinema 4D. I'm gonna create a new project. Open up the live viewer, go to objects, Octane VDB volume. So that creates a container for your VDB, and it creates a VDB volume over here. So select that. Make sure you select VDB and under file, click on the three dots and go to your VDB folder. Now, all you have to do is select the first frame in your sequence, so 0000, and click on open. So I know this starts on frame zero and it ends on frame 144. Now you can notice there's still writing here at the bottom, which means that it actually recognizes my sequence. But as soon as I put, you know, the end of my sequence, 144, and press enter, now it says it's not found. So this VDB sequence is actually not going to work. And the reason for that is because the digits is still on zero. And that's why I said these digits over here are extremely important. So we know we've got four digits within our sequence. So all you have to do is put your sequence on four. And there we go. Those numbers return. And now our VDB sequence is going to work. So another important thing is my units. I'm going to keep it on meters. But here by my grid mapping, I want to change all of this to flames. And now if I send this over to the live viewer, there we go, we get to see our simulation within the program. So now for some reason, it still looks like it's on its side, uh, even though it should have imported at the correct orientation. So let me show you how to fix that right now and how you can actually rotate the VDBs. If you go over here to this icon, hold down the left mouse button and select object, right? You'll actually be able to rotate and scale VDBs. So if I just hold down shift and rotate this, I'll rotate that in increments and I can rotate that at 90 degrees. So now it's facing in the correct orientation. Okay, so we got it at the correct orientation. You can see over here, there's, there's also an option for velocity motion blur. So if you go there and you enable velocity mo motion blur, remember we did export out the settings for that. So the X, Y, and Z. Now for some reason, I, I don't know, I just can't get this to work. If you guys know, how you can get this motion blur to work even with the velocity settings please comment below uh, but there we go so these settings are good to go we can head over to medium and i'll show you how to start shading this okay so let's better visualize the scene let's go to objects lights octane daylight then select your vdb volume go to medium and then just click on this white cube over here to go into the volume medium now these settings are extremely important volume step length and density by decreasing the volume step length, I'm basically making my VDB a lot more detailed. So you can see if I zoom in here, I can see a lot more detail on the VDB. But by increasing my density, I can make it even more detailed. You can see I went from 100 to 5,000. So by playing around with these settings, increasing the density and the volume step length, I'll make my VDB look a lot better. But that also means that it's going to increase the render time. So just keep that in mind. But this is how you add more detail and quality onto the VDBs. So this is where all the magic happens for actually shading this VDB. You wanna to go to Emission, 
then by emission click on this drop down arrow I'm gonna to go to plugins cinema 40 octane and you want to bring in a texture emission Right, so you can see right now it's fully blown out, made my entire VDB completely white. So go into your texture emission and just decrease the power. Right, decrease it. Now you can see that that glowing emission. So in our original VDB from um, from Embergen, a lot of the orange elements of that VDB were closer towards the bottom. So by by controlling the power, you can choose exactly where you want that heat uh, to be visible. So now I'll just go back and then under the emission ramp, click on the drop down arrow, go to plugin, cinema 40 octane, and you want to create a volume gradient. Now this is where you actually add some color onto your VDB. So go into the volume gradient. So you can see it's on black and white. And now if I just click over here and create another color picker, then double click to bring up uh, all of my different colors over here. Let's maybe put some blue. And you can see now I've added some blue onto that region so this looks like some magical uh, smoke and obviously all of this dark smoke is a result of the actual simulation itself because the simulation had a lot of the smoke in it uh, but if you play around with this max value you can see I can actually blend between this blue and white value so let's actually make this yellow just to show you the difference so now I'm blending between the blue and the yellow on my VDB. And if I want it to be, you know, really faint and closer towards this black smoke, that's how I do that. Now, if you really wanted to change the color of this black, you know, bluey smoke, you just go to scattering and then over here by RGB spectrum, go into the RGB spectrum, and then by color, you can change the color, right? So now it's, it's still dark, but it's like a blue tinted, you know, really thick looking smoke. Uh, but your density as well, you can see how that looks. And this density slider plays a really, really important role uh, with the way your VDBs look. But this is how you color the smoke. Uh, but the most important aspect is definitely this emission, I would say. You know, making this emission brighter, you can see how it really starts to affect the overall look of the smoke. So you can create some really fantastic looking VDBs uh, with this emission and uh, just playing around with the gradient slider as well. So have fun with that, come up with your own colors. And uh, yeah, this is exactly how I shaded the VDBs on my animation. And then all I did was in that scene, I selected my VDBs, Control C, Control V. I would duplicate VDBs like this, put them at different angles, right? I know they're all flowing from the exact same uh, angle like that. You can see even if I'm scrubbing forward, I'll just scrub on my timeline and just duplicate those VDBs and place them around my scene. Some of them, you know, would maybe have less density than others so that they look different uh, just to add a little bit more variety. But yeah, this is how you input the VDBs and how you can actually shade them. Uh, but the lighting in the scene also plays a really important role with the way light is actually cast against the smoke. You can see when it's a lot lighter in the scene, that really dark smoke with this blue tint uh, looks a lot lighter now. So that's really cool as well. You've got these purple highlights. And this would look pretty cool as an animation right now. We've got these two VDB volumes and this twirling tornado smoke. So just something else to mention, since we're working with VDBs with emission, uh, if you create an octane camera, go into the camera and if you go to post-processing and you enable post-processing and increase some of the blue, Anything that's glowing with emission will just glow a little bit brighter. This bloom really uh, helps to sell that glowing effect. So that's really important. It's with the camera settings. But yeah, this is how you import the VDBs and how you shade them. So that's exactly what I've done with these VDBs. You can see there's multiple versions. Like I mentioned, I duplicated some of them, placed them in different areas at different angles. Uh, but try to get that flow. Obviously, I want them to flow in the same direction. So I didn't change the direction of flow uh, of the VDBs. But you can see even if I just select one of these VDBs, go into the medium, the exact same stuff we set up, the texture emission and the volume gradient. This is what I used for the fire gradient uh, with my max value. And there's my emission value as well. And that gives it this nice, really awesome looking glowing effect. 
And by a being able to duplicate those VDBs, I make the simulation look a lot more complex, but it's the exact same VDB. So it's just reusing those assets to make the scene look more, more detailed, uh, but obviously doing it strategically. So in case you're wondering, let me just show you the camera settings in the scene. On my camera settings, I've got some bloom enabled. Like I said, it makes the emission areas glow a lot brighter. My camera image over here, my response is on linear and you know, just some gamma and exposure. This highlight compression, if you actually bump this up, anything that looks blown out with highlights, it helps to tame that. Now, some other important settings over here, if I go to this gear icon, I'm using path tracing. And one of the main issues I was dealing with uh, because there's emission over here, are these, you see like these little dots or whatever, they call fireflies and they can be really annoying in 3D scenes. So on path tracing, one way to deal with that is sometimes you can play around with the GI clamp value, but on the actual camera settings under camera imager, if you go to hot pixel remover, this by default is on one. Right, let me just unpause that. I want to show you what it looks like on one. So on one, these fireflies are like really, really intense. Okay, but by decreasing this hot pixel remover, notice that how I can start taming all of these fireflies in the scene. So it's just one way to have a lot more control, you know, with reducing these, these damn fireflies that are so annoying uh, that tend to pop up, especially with emission materials. Uh, this is just one way to tame that. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Got the camera set up. I showed you these settings in my gear icon using path tracing. I only did 256 samples. That was more than enough for me. And uh, yeah, that was basically it. So some other settings on the camera. I did enable motion blur, and this is a good value they recommend you use, 0 0.02. Right? You can, if you go higher than that, the motion blur looks like insane. Uh, it looks very unnatural. Uh, but I did apply that, and then on my VDBs, I created I created these um, octane object tags, and under the motion blur, I even put that on vertex speed. But yeah, for some reason, I don't know. I couldn't get. I just can't get these VDBs with the motion blur with the motion blur to actually work, even while using uh, velocity. So if you guys know how to troubleshoot that, please comment below. Uh, but yeah, that's that's about it. Then on the camera, I did apply some thin lens as well. I turned off autofocus and I actually use manual focus on this dude over here. So I just select male because I, obviously he's the star of the show. I want him to be in focus. So it applies some blur to the foreground objects and I can control that with the aperture. So by increasing that aperture amount, it applies uh, a lot more motion, uh, a lot more uh, depth of field to these objects over here. All right, and then on the camera itself, the animation is super simple. It just pans in. Right, it just zooms in a little bit, slow, zoom in animation, and then I was good to go, and then I could just go to, you know, if I'm doing an animation, I can go to edit render settings, changes to octane render, uh, with my output, choose my resolution, my amount of frames. Uh, when I'm saving this, I want to save it as a PNG, so this will save it as an image sequence. It's just a lot more flexible, especially if you want to make changes. Because if you save this out as an MP4, you can't fix an MP4, but you can fix an image sequence. And then I would uh, import that into Premiere Pro as an image sequence and save it out of Premiere Pro uh, as an MP4. And that's basically it regarding the camera settings. And then probably the last thing to mention, just with you know keeping composition in mind, because that's really important uh, whenever you're creating these scenes. You want a really nice composition. So the way I set up the scene in terms of composition, like I mentioned at the beginning, I made these rocks a lot darker because they, you can obviously still see the rocks in the scene, but I don't want them to be the main attraction. And then we've got the subject over here that is almost completely white. So a lighter character against a darker background obviously stands out a lot more and it creates more of a focal point in my scene. But I was also strategic with the way I, you know, laid out these rocks. If I had to actually uh, illustrate this or show you what I mean, all of the smoke is flowing like in a very specific direction, but the direction of the smoke is also drawing, uh, you know, the attention towards our main subject over here. Even if we look at this guy, he's looking towards the statue. So our eyes, even if we look at him, we tend to look back at the statue. And with these rocks as well, they just have this general flow 
that also directs our attention towards the statue because I want you to look at this character and then all of our smoke obviously is also flowing in this direction so all of this is creating these leading lines it create more focus and attention on the star of the show which is our statue over here and again this is a darker character against a lighter background I always love playing around with dark characters on light backgrounds or light on black it just creates some really interesting you know a visual interest when it comes to composition and then of course color grading is also very important uh, now I did do the color grading in Premiere Pro but if you're doing a still image uh, in Photoshop it's actually really helpful just to use select color so maybe if you've got some reds in your scene you can actually make them look a lot more intense or even change the colors completely uh, but by playing around with some of the neutrals, maybe bumping that up, you can make those black uh, areas a lot lighter or a lot darker. It's up to you. Uh, and you can also play around with some of the exposure if you feel like you didn't get the correct exposure within Octane Render. Okay, but that's it uh, for composition. Okay, so that's going to be the end of this breakdown video. Hopefully this has given you insight into how this entire animation was created. You can see just how simple the scene is. There's rocks, there's a human, there's a sky, and there's a VDB. Uh, but the way everything is, you know, merged together to create the scene, I personally think looks really cool. And a lot of you guys really enjoyed this animation. And you were asking for a breakdown. So there we go. I gave you the complete breakdown so that you can create your own scenes as well. You can see just how powerful Embergen is and how simple it is to import these VDBs and shade them. Uh, with octane render All right so you guys are super awesome i truly appreciate the support on this channel stay tuned for some more videos and tutorials and goodbye